Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036369, 0703 768119. Email address lsmedia at or visit our website at www.livingseed.org. Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. I thank God. I'm trying to be a Christian little by little. Ah, I said you don't know what you are doing. You can never, by your own, walk your way out into the kingdom. There is a chain. Is a dominion. If anybody says, if you fast 10 days, you will be free. It's deceiving you. You can't. There is a cord that has to be caught. And it can only be done by the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, but listen, when he rescued us, when he snatched us, when he cut us off, he did not leave us hanging around. What did he do? He translated. Oh, what's the meaning of translate? Translate. Amen. 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 Wait. Wait. Let's do sign. Can we do a little science? In science, there are different kinds of transformation. Different kinds of transformation. There is a transformation we call stretching. It's a form of translation. Sit down properly. And be careful that you don't shift from your seat. But I want your hand to reach me. Do try. 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 What am I doing to him? That is stretching. That's a form of transformation. In mathematics, such transformation is the transformation that we use in what we call elasticity. Stretch. But before you can do that kind of transformation, the first thing is that the coordinate axis, that is the basis, has to be what? Fixed. If you want to stretch something, and you don't fix one side, can you stretch it? You see, that's one form of transformation. Unfortunately, that's the kind of transformation that some of you have experienced. A transformation where your root is still fixed in the kingdom of darkness. But what are you doing now? You are stretching if you can cut some things from the kingdom of God. In Yoruba language, that kind of transformation among Beni Naga. Do you understand that now? His hand cannot reach, but he's stretchy. He's stretchy. And do you know what normally what happens? 
whatever his hand catches when he hangs onto it once it cuts what happens to himself he falls back to his original position there are so many people that you call Christians they have not yet experienced correct transformation but they are experiencing a stretching into the things of God they are catching some little little things from the kingdom of God but their coordinate axis their root where is it now is still in the world There's an improvement quite all right in their lives. They are stretching themselves to be patient. But the real issue in their nature is still based in the old nature, the old world. That is why you see them if the force that is stretching them was very strong, if the message was strong, if the fellowship was strong, if the man of God had a great anointing, they will stretch. You will even be seeing their head in the other kingdom. But look at their feet. Where is their feet? In the other world. There are many people like that. They have tried to stretch their lives into the kingdom of God. But their axis, their basis, the basic genetic nature of their lives is still worldly. They are trying to make their old worldliness to stretch into the kingdom of God it will not do that's one form of stretching if you are mathematics students now we will have gone into mathematics it will have been more easier for me now I will have shown you that when you want to stretch you keep the you keep at least one axis fixed and you add to the other ordinates. So, for example, if you want to stretch horizontally, you keep the vertical fixed. Are you understanding? Then you are stretching this way. And if you want to stretch vertically, you keep the horizontal fixed. Are you understanding that now? But God, he knows that stretching will not solve the problem. Are you getting what I'm saying? There's another kind of transformation. We call it twisting. Twisting is another transformation in science. They are all relevant in the Bible. Twisting. What is twisting? <clears throat> twisting is a form of transformation that only changes the angular displacement without a linear displacement. You are not understanding what I'm saying. <laughs> I know you don't. God will help us. Hallelujah. Now you see to twist is to is to try to turn something look at me like this this is me but twisting what am I doing to my neck now excuse me I'm changing the, the direction I'm changing the angle. Normally, for my head to behave well, the head and the neck 
must be perpendicular to my shoulder. Are you understanding that now? But when a transformation takes place, which I call twist, and I don't want my chest to turn, so what do I do? I fix the chest and twist the neck. Try it. Try it. Let me see. Try it. How are you feeling? Very painful. Oh. Some people, they are finding Christianity very painful. Because the transformation that they have experienced is a mere twisting. Twisting transformation. Are you following me? The whole of their lives and their nature, their focus, their direction, their ambition is basically the same. But they are just having a small twist. See, sister, we are not asking you to change completely. Just look here. Jesus is doing something good here. Hallelujah. They can twist to attend Holy Ghost nights. They say if it is just night VG that I won't sleep throughout the night. I say, I'm fine. And something good will happen to me. No problem. They will endure. They are twisting. No. That is the major reason why you see people they only have reliefs. No permanent solution. They are praying over the same problem again and again. But anytime they pray, anytime they twist, just turn your eyes a little. Just turn to Jesus. Small. We are not asking you to change your business pattern. We are not asking you to change your lifestyle. I just saying, instead of going here and there, turn small, just twist a bit to Jesus. The gospel doesn't need to change you completely, but just to twist you small. So some people are just experiencing twist. Just a twist. But you know, everything in nature, and that is the normal thing, resist change. Is that okay? And as soon as the force that is causing twist, whereas if it is linear displacement, it's a straight force. But whereas when it is a twist, it is not a force that is making you move. It's a force that is just changing your angle. So it has to be what we call a couple, a talk. Just doing you like I don't know how to express that to you. But it's a force. One is pulling you front, and almost equal force is pulling you back. That's how to get a twist. Some of you are just experiencing a twist. There's a force that is saying, Come forward for God. And there is almost an equal opposite force that is pulling you backward. But it is not operating at the same point of application. Do you understand that? If it was operating at the same point, it would be equal to zero. You will not have, nothing will have changed. And I pray you understand what I'm saying. There are times... <coughs> Some of you are wondering, why is your Christian life not straightforward? The truth is that on one side of your life, there is a desire to follow God. Are you understanding now? But 
on the second side of your life, there is something else that you did not drop that is pulling you back. So whereas you are moving like this, the other one is moving you like this. So what is it producing for you? Let me tell you, brother. If, for example, you got a correct grace of God to stop fornication. But in the area of your business, you've not stopped giving bribe. What you are experiencing that you are calling Christianity is what? A twist. And you are not going anywhere. In fact, the devil is not afraid of that. Because he knows nothing has changed. The coordinates are still intact. Are you getting me? There is yet another transformation which we call enlargement. Enlargement. Enlargement may look like promotion. But enlargement is simply a multiplication. You just take a multiplying factor and multiply all the various dimensions. You may not necessarily transfer from the location. Do you understand that now? Some people think, thank God because they are getting promoted, they are getting enlargement, they are getting money. And that's where the prosperity preacher, that's where they are experts. Their transformation is what? Enlargement. Not necessarily a change. It's a change. Every transformation is a change. Is that okay? A change in size. Not necessarily a change in location. But there is the other kind of transformation which we call translation. And what is translation? Translation is a transformation that takes place by the relocation of the coordinate axis. Is it alright? Alright. Before you can have translation all the coordinates in all the directions. If you are dealing with a three-dimensional figure, all the three different dimensions, all their directions, they are changed. So can we demonstrate translation now? Translation is a moving, an uprooting from one location Did you see that? What have I done? I have jumped. Jumping is a form of transformation which we call translation. I am standing here before, but now I'm here. If you go there and say, Where is Brother Gwile? What would they say? It's no more here. His place is vacant. Are you getting me? Now, for God to deliver us from the devil and to make us the kind of man he wants us to be, the kind of transformation that must take place in your life must be translation. Translation means a displacement from the former location into another place entirely. That kind of transformation, you can call it transfer. Is that all right? Now, imagine that there were members of this uh, church sometime last year that were transferred to Abuja. 
If they were a member of the choir, can they sing now? Why not? They are transferred. If somebody comes and says, Oh, I'm looking for uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chooks. He used to be a Sunday school teacher here. Ah, they say what? He is transferred. Are you following me? When a man is transferred, anytime they are doing roll call in his former location, can can he answer again? Once they are calling their role and they call on his name, what will everybody call us? Transferred. Transferred. Cancel his name. He is no more here. And he has been located somewhere else and has been confirmed there. Transferred. They say, what of the query that we are planning to give him? They say, well, transferred. What of his payment voucher? Where does he go now? To the new location. Transferred. Let me ask you. Have you been transferred? From the kingdom of darkness? When they are calling their role in the kingdom of darkness and they reach my name and say, Billy Akani, they say what? Transferred. This is the reason. Why, when the devil is looking for me, he can never find me anymore. Why? Transferred. Are you understanding that now? You see, the devil, listen, may God help you to understand the Bible. The devil only exercises authority within his domain. But once you are outside the boundary of the devil, his power is finished. And the Bible said, and has translated us where? Into. Into. Do you understand that kind of thing? It's like when he took us now, uprooted us. What did he do now? Tom. Inside. Not at the periphery of the kingdom. Inside. So he said, your life is hid in Christ, in God. In Hallelujah. Have you, ever, have you ever seen a small child taking stone from some place and he threw it into water? What sound do you hear? <laughs> Hallelujah. And he has translated us into That's how it should happen. Indeed, you have experienced salvation. Would you hear that sound? Boom. When they hear it in hell, they say, Ah, oh, the law. <laughs> Where he is now is untouchable. Thousands can fall by his left hand side, tens of thousands by his right. You know, go come near him because where he is is another territory. It's another territory. And we can't get there because he's the kingdom of his dear son in the light. And we are darkness. Darkness can never enter light. I tell you, we lose. I pray you have a genuine experience. So the Bible said, He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and has done what? Translated us. 
Hallelujah. So look, when we talk that a Christian, you can leave this meeting tonight and the demon that used to harass you, if you like, are you listening to me? If you like, don't bind them. Don't bind them. Do you know why? They only operate where? In their domain, their territory. And where God is translating you now, they cannot come. If you only have that knowledge, you can tell the devil, now I'm going to sleep. Where I'm going to sleep. Try, 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 try. If you can come, try. Try. Once he heard, you don't go. He has escaped. Let's leave him. We can only wait in case we can entice him to come out. Oh my God. He said, let's wait. Let's stand by the fence. In case he wants to come out. But you know what Jesus said? He said, abide in me. What's the meaning of abide? Stay. Don't go anywhere. Just stay here. I'm telling you. He said, he that dwell in the secret place of the most high. He shall abide. Where? In the shadow. This. What's the meaning of that? If someone is staying under the shadow of somebody, what happens? Can you see him? In tomb. They will be looking for me like this. Looking for me like this. The only thing they see is what? Shadows. Hallelujah. Yeah. Ah. If any demon say he's looking for brother Bile, I say go ahead. You can only see shadows. And it's not even my own shadow. You know the Babala war of those days? They say if you don't catch it, if you can catch a shadow. Bring the shadow. But unfortunately, the one that they can catch now is not even my shadow. If anybody can do something with the shadow of the Almighty, make him try. That's our deliverance. But you see, the implication of that deliverance is that you lose your position, your place, your seat where in the former kingdom this is where the trouble is some of you are having complexity in your christian life why you want translation but you don't want relocation <laughs> and i don't see where you are going To fully enjoy the deliverance that the Lord Jesus Christ brings, I must be ready to accept relocation. Now I'm telling you, wherever there is a relocation, there is a reallocation. But the devil is telling you, if you agree now, there will be no allocation for you over there. Who told you? So many of us are afraid to let go our location here because we are thinking there is no allocation for us in the other place. Is it not true? You are transferred to Abuja. They gave you an allocation, an housing allocation in the 1004. Eh? 
the man said, I am not sure of any new house allocation in Abuja. So I will not park yet. So when you get to Abuja, all your belongings, where are they? <laughs> Every day you are phoning Lagos. What is happening? What is happening? There are many Christians. They are so restless. So unsettled. In the kingdom. Do you know why? They are maintaining. Their houses. Their location. On this other side. And they keep phoning. Into the world all the time. What is going on there? What is going on there? Baba said, forget about that. There's an allocation for you here. May I tell you, sister, if you are engaged to a man in the world, if you want to experience the kingdom life, you must accept relocation. And when you accept God's relocation, that transfer, wait for a new allocation. If you are clinging to the old allocation and you want a relocation, it's a contradiction. Am I speaking to your heart? Yes. God will help us. Amen. The only way and all of this, I still said, we are only still looking towards the principle that is leading us to the issue of this marriage. It's, if you don't get it like this from principles, uh, Christianity will be a problem to you. You will have problems, you will be everyday struggling, and this is worrying me. I say, why is it worrying you? That thing you are talking about is not in our territory. It's not in the kingdom of God. And you say, you know, eh, but all my things are in Lagos. So each time I visit people who have been relocated, but who are refusing to give up old allocation, you know what happened? The new house, I mean the new place, they are temporary. They just carry portfolio. No food. You see an old man just eating bread and butter. <laughs> Only. What is his problem? He is refusing to give up the other allocation. Every weekend, he is going down. May God help you. Amen. How many Christians that every weekend, every three, three months, every year, something takes them down. And they are always confessing sin. Accept this new allocation from God. Give up the other one. That thing you are holding on to. It only looks good because you've been used to it. The devil is telling you that if you lose this now, you don't get anything again. You are doing a business that is based on the world system. The foundational principle of your business is worldly. It's not Christian. Now you have become a Christian. I tell you, you have experienced a relocation. Give up that allocation. Ask God, now that I'm in the kingdom, what shall I do? What is my allocation in the kingdom? Oh, it will be interesting. God will give you a new allocation. Amen. And God's allocation is 100 times Better than the allocation you are holding to now. But who will do this? 
who will agree. They say, brother, let's continue. We will see how we can change the business small, small. We'll be changing it little by little. Changing it little by little. That's why your Christian life is weak. That's why you keep taking a trip down to Egypt almost every three, three months. That's why you are having conflict. That's why you are unsettled. Uh-huh. Have you followed me to that point? So we leave, we leave that now. I have reached the point where we can go forward. Hallelujah. Yeah. Now, you see, when you get into the, into the kingdom, a man that you fought to capture, what do you call him? Is a captive. Our original name is what? Captives. We are captives of the Lord. He said, read the Bible again, Ephesians 4. I hope you are now here. All the length and length I'm talking about is to bring us to this point. Amen. So that scripture says, verse 8. Wherefore he says, when he ascended up on earth, what did he do? He left captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. You know what the marginal translation of that scripture says? He led a multitude of captives. Please, Baba, stand up, follow me. Stand up, follow me. Baba, please stand up, follow me. Oga, follow me. God bless you. (coughs) Imagine that I went into battle against the enemy. And when I was coming back, they say, How was it? I said, Praise the Lord. Tell them your story. (laughs) What were you before I caught you? You see that? They said, this man used to be a terrible drunkard. Highly. (laughs) Before I caught him. Before I caught him. Look at him now. He's my captive now. And this one, you all know him. You know him. Can I call his wife to testify? (laughs) The wife said, Ah, until Jesus captured him, we never saw him any weekend. But now, he's either going to church, reading his Bible, that's all. Behold, all sins have become. Did you not you remember this man what he used to be in the world before I captured him? All the preachers that came near him say he will argue and argue and argue and all the babala woes that he went. How is it now? You see him smiling? Five years ago, did you ever see a smile in his face? <laughs> I have captured him. So the Bible says, let's read the Bible. Because I don't want you to think this brother, he is just entertaining us. We are reading Bible. Let's go to Second Corinthians. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 2. Look at what the Bible says. Verse 14. If someone will read King James, another person would help me read NIV. If you have good news or living Bible, help me check them quickly. Now thanks be unto God. 
He always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Thank you. NIV, please. Thanks be to God. I didn't want you to sit down before you sat down. <laughs> See what the Bible says. That he always leads us about. Anywhere Jesus is going. To show that he has conquered the devil. What is the evidence? This is the devil. So we are moving. So they, all of them are saying, In the time past, I was in darkness. Only Son of God brought me into light. When the girlfriends that used to, they used to run after, when they see those girls, they say, The girls I used to chase, I chase them no more. Hallelujah. Girls I used to chase. Oh, I chase them no more. The girls I used to chase. Oh, I chase them no more. That is a great chase since I'm born again. Hallelujah! Yeah. Then people say, ah, I still also join them. You say, ah, Jesus captured him also. He was captured. They say, what? You mean that man can change? They say, ah, there's nothing God cannot do. He leads us about, thank you, sir, as captives in his triumphal procession. Good news. Where's good news? Yes. Yes. Do you see that? We are the people that Jesus uses to announce his victory over the devil. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, that to say Jesus is the Lord of all and that he has conquered the devil, it is not just shouting. It is that you have become a living evidence. Every time the devil sees you, the things he used to push you up and down to do before, you no longer do them. You are free. You are the only excellent testimony that Jesus actually is doing something. Do you understand that now? Amen. So you see, everywhere we go, he uses us to demonstrate the savour of his knowledge. Don't ever think that the greatest thing God wanted is preaching. Just uh, reading Bible and carrying Bible. No, 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 no. What God is looking for is evidence. 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 Pick somebody. They say, ah, that's a, that's a uh, tayo. Oh, what if Jesus can do that that's evidence she's now captured hallelujah Amen. listen now have you followed me to that point yes. even if that is the only thing that Jesus did for us is it not enough if all he just wanted to do for us is to capture us and set us free from where we were and translate us relocate us and give us a new allocation in the kingdom of God that is enough but I'm telling you he did something else that is where this message is coming forth turn your Bibles let's go back we are checking scriptures. We are studying. At any point when we will stop, we just pray. We we'll come back again tomorrow trusting the Lord. Now, turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy 21. <coughs> D. 
Deuteronomy 21. Are you there? Okay. Now, carefully, we will read from verse 10. 21 from verse 10. When thou goest forth to war against your enemies, and the Lord thy God has delivered them into your hands, and thou hast taken them captive, Did you see the premise? Has Jesus fulfilled that premise? Yes. All right. Verse 11 now introduce a subject. And fears among the captives a beautiful woman and has a desire unto her that thou wouldest have her to be your wife. I don't know whether you are following me, small small. If we stop at verse 10, he has taken captives. He can use them anywhere, isn't it? Because they are, they are, they are indebted to him, they are his captives. But now, we are discovering something. And fears among the captives a woman, a beautiful woman, and you have a desire unto her that thou wouldest have her to your wife. You now want to change the status of that woman to become a co partner, a wife. what and what and what must be done. I don't know whether you understand what I'm talking about. What and what and what are the guidelines? What are the principles? And do you know the Bible says, you search the scriptures, you think in them you have eternal life, but they are testifying about one man. All scripture is speaking about one man. is the Lord Jesus. All scriptures, they find their fulfillment in Christ Jesus. So this is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. And you have a desire unto her that thou wouldest have her to your wife. Then you will do what? Thou shalt bring her home to your house. You, are, you will bring her home into your house. Why didn't Jesus just deliver us and keep us as captives somewhere? Where do you normally keep slaves? Eh? Back house. BQ. That's the right word now. The boy's quarters. But do you know the Lord Jesus, having delivered us, he did not keep us in the boys' quarter. He did not keep us out there as people whom he has helped and all they need to be doing is just to be fearful. When you come, they say, oh God, they come. Oh God, they come. Ah, welcome, sir. Welcome, sir. Welcome. No. He has a desire. The Lord Jesus has a desire. What is that desire? To have you 
Not just as a slave. Not just as a house girl. Not just as a houseboy. Not just as a servant. But as his wife. We were caught it. We don't merit it. Even if he does not have that desire for us, we are forever indebted to him. He saved us. But there is an extra desire in his heart. I want to share. And do you know the meaning of that? I want to share my father's name with you. I want to share my inheritance with you. I want to share my, my life with you. I'm going to leave my father and my mother. I'm going to become one with you. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. I speak concerning Christ and his church. It was him who left his glory in order to become one with us. If you know what Jesus is now, he is, the, is a man. He is the glorified man who is our high priest in the presence of God now. He agreed to be joined that both ourselves and himself can become one flesh. Sharing the same nature, bearing the same name, standing in the same place, sitting on the same seat. Since I don't have the time tonight, we will have needed to wait and look at that verse 11 and 12 more. But I must move because even if I stay there, we won't finish. It says, Thou shalt bring her home. And I want you to see in many ways that God has brought us home into his own house, into his own inheritance. He said, I call you no more servant. For a servant does not know what his Lord doeth. And I call you friends. Because all that my father has shown to me, I have shown it to you. We were captives. We should be grateful. And that's what some of us don't know. We just thought that Christianity is to get delivered from that demon that is running after you. Some of us just thought, oh, let me join church because I'm told that once you go to church, all your problems will be solved. Fine. The Lord does that. He still does it. He will still do it. Even if that's all why you came, He will still give you your miracle. There's no problem about that. Once you agree to relocate and to wait for his own new allocation, drop the old allocation that the devil is using to pull you back. But the question is that he has a desire. I want you to say the Lord has a desire for me. He has a desire to share his life with me. To make me his bride. Yes. That's a desire. He has this intention. And that's why he brought us home. 
That's why everywhere Jesus had been, he has brought us there. Do you know that's why you can pray? Do you know that? That's why you can speak directly to God the Father. Because he brought you home. And anytime there's a query in the heavenlies, what is this man doing here? The Lord Jesus, our advocate, he stands up there and says, Nami brother. I'm the one who brought her here. I have an intention for her. She's my intended. That's what he introduces us to God. But what must be done? I'll quickly go into it now. Then shall thou bring her home to your house. I tell you, Jesus has done that. Has he not done it? He has. Do you know what the Bible says? Say, now you are no more strangers. But what are we? Fellow citizens of what? The household of God. Is that not what the Bible says? Ephesians chapter 2. That's what it says. He brought us home. He shared his estate with us. He gave us his name. He removed from us the spirit, the beggarly spirit of timidity and put within us the spirit of adoption whereby we also can say, Abba, Father. Just to give us an assurance that we have a place. What did he tell them when he was going? He said, I am going to my father. To do what? To prepare a place for you. That wheresoever I am, there will be a soul. He brought us home. But look at the word of God. Something that the wife, the woman, must do. Are you following this once more? What must this woman do? And she, please take note of the word and there. The word and. You know that we are being moving small, small. Amen. When we started in verse 10, he talked about when. What preposition, what, what kind of thing does when represent in grammar? Time. Abi, That's preposition for time. When. Has that time taken place or not? It has. The Lord has done that. He had gone forth to battle and the Lord has delivered unto him the enemy and he has taken captives. That's why we are here. When Jesus died on the cross, the devil didn't know what Jesus was doing. He was fighting to capture us. And I'm happy that I'm here. A testimony. Ah, If you know where I would have been today, it would have been terrible. I would have been something terrible. But thank God for Jesus. That has taken place. You see, the and is a conjunction. Abi? And it's a conjunction joining verse 10. And you see, if there was no verse 10, that verse shouldn't start with and. Is that okay? So, verse 11 is a result of verse 10. And yes, among the captive, a beautiful woman. So, let me say to you, brothers and sisters, if you have not yet been captured from the kingdom of darkness, he doesn't see you. 
you are not beautiful. Any man who is not yet captured and transferred and relocated from the kingdom of darkness, there's, there's nothing. Whether you are wearing the most expensive dress, whether you are riding the most expensive car, whether you have the best mansion in this country, he doesn't see you. He doesn't know you are there. You are not beautiful. Even your prayer, say the prayer of the wicked man, what is it? It's abomination before God. All your good works, what does he appear to is a filthy rag. The Lord doesn't want to look at it. Don't think that God is looking at you when you have not been delivered from the life of sin. Say, unto whom shall I look? The man of a contrite and a humble spirit who trembles at my word. I'm noting those conjunctions because something happened before something happened. Don't jump into verse 11 when you are not in verse 10 because verse 11 is only but a follow-up of verse 10. That's why the word and opened it. It's not a mistake. The prepositions and the conjunctions of the word of God, they are strategically placed. They were not randomly used. When I was learning how to write composition in secondary school, I did not know the use of conjunction and prepositions. All I just think about is anything that can give variety that will make it beautiful. If I started a paragraph with uh, when, when I'm going to if I'm going to start another one, I say, however. <laughs> In consequence. You see? And I, 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 I try to cram it. So that my essay will not look monotonous. It will have varieties, at least. If I use however this time. Instead of you seeing however next time I say conversely. <laughs> Are you understanding right now? I have all those words on my fingertips. Once I'm writing my essay, I will write them in the jotter, so I'll be picking them one. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, that is not why the conjunctions and the prepositions of the Bible were put. They have divine reasons. Don't take them for granted. If we suddenly come to a scripture and you use but, then you should look very well. If it says nevertheless, there's something that, that is contrary and he's saying even though that is taking place, don't mind it. Are you understanding that now? So here he say, and can you imagine that you remove verse 10? You read verse 9. So shall thou put away the guilt of innocent blood from among you, and when thou shalt do that which is right in the sight of the Lord, then you move to verse 11. And seest among the captives a beautiful woman. Does it make meaning? No meaning. It will make no meaning. If you did not experience verse 10. Hallelujah. Amen. The message of the spotless bride. Is only for those that have been captured. Are you following what I'm saying? You already have testimony. How God saved you. How God delivered you. How you were. Oh yes. In the time past. You see how we were singing and marching around. Good. That is when 
verse 11 and 12 should be applied. So, listen. The reason why I need to show you that is to make you understand that there are good things that has happened to you when you were delivered and transferred and brought into the kingdom of God and brought into the house of God. With some of us, we can tell stories about, we can write books about and all of that. But, because of the desire of Jesus to have us as his wife, there are further things to do. As a result of our deliverance. So don't think the next issues I will be raising here, don't think it's for unbelievers. Say when some of us have repented and say, Hallelujah, 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 Amen. We think all that remain is claiming promises, binding demons, claiming contracts, and riding big cars, and occasionally support God's work. Listen, there's something that you are going to sit down with now. So, you will not see verse verse 12. Then, shall I bring her home to your house? Did you see it then there? You see, it's a follow-up. Then is a preposition of ordinary. Have you? You know I didn't study English, but I hope I'm following. Am I correct? Oh, good. Then is a preposition of order. Arrangement. Something happens first. Another thing happens. Then. Okay. That ended there. Then in our say, and that word and now say, when he has done all of that, what is your own contribution? The word and there is, is contribution. How do I put that now? Please take this. Eh? And this one. Do you see that now? So, when the Lord has done all his own, what is your own necessary contribution? So the Bible says, and she shall when you use the word shall, what's the meaning of that? Must. It could have been must. But you see, it was put politely. But it's must. But you see, I don't know. I, I don't know why I need to deal with grammar a bit. That scripture should have been must. But must talks of coercion. Most talks of force, even when you don't like it. But when you don't put most and you say shall, what have you done? You have removed the external coercion. You are leaving it to the choice of the person that it should willingly do it. You see, God will have used most then will I be a dictator? But he didn't use must. He said, shall. It's like if you are reasonable. If you are considerate. If you are right thinking. I don't need to compel you. You will have known that that is what you should do. 
And you see, some Christians, they don't know how to respond until they are whipped. Some Christians, the only language they know, sit here, you must not stand up. And once there is no must in a matter, they will hide their foolishness in the politeness of the master. By saying, well, you didn't, you didn't give us a clear, you didn't say I must. It looks optional, that's why I didn't do it. The message I'm passing on to you now actually is a must. But it's not a must. It's supposed to be a response of love from your heart. If you don't do it, of course, you are wrong. But at the same time, it only proves that you are not appreciative. This message is a must, yet it's not a must. The master put it like that. So that it will be something from your heart. It will be something you are willing to do because you understood what he did for you. So, let's get it. I know very much in my mind, I will just stop in verse 12. I can't go beyond here tonight. But let me put that to a point where we can pray. When we come tomorrow, we will start there. And she shall shave her head and pair her nails. And she shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her and shall remain in your house and bewail her father and her mother a full month and after that so let me stop there when you read when you read Revelations 19 let's take a quick digression put your hand here we have not finished But I want to show you something so that you can see something as the Lord enables us tonight. Revelations 19. You know we referred to it yesterday. Uh But I want you to see something very quickly. If we can read it from King James, RSV or NIV, I will be very happy. Where is the... Let's start from... So read verse 7, only verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. Yes. Let's note that scripture. Read it from NIV for me. Yes, sir. And give him glory. Yes. Is there RSV? Revised Standard Version? And read it. Let's rejoice and exalt. And give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife had made herself ready. Good news. There's something I want you to see there quickly. Good news. Let us rejoice and be glad. Yes. For the time has come for the wedding of the Lamb. Amen. You will notice a preposition there or a conjunction they use for. What's another word for? Because 
He said, let us rejoice and be glad. Because the marriage of the Lamb has come. And the wife, the bride, had made herself ready. So let me ask you, why hasn't the time of the marriage, why hasn't it come? Eh? The bride is not ready. So return back to Deuteronomy 21. You will notice that from verse 12, and she shall shave her head and pair her nails and shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her and shall remain in your house and bewail her father and um, her mother for a full month. You will notice towards the end of that, what did he say? And after that, thou shalt go in. What's the meaning of that? Before all these things are done, can you come in? the consummation of the marriage of the Lamb hasn't come since the past 2,000 years. Who is causing the problem? Ourselves. So listen. Why must you respond to this message? One I want to say. It will only be correct to respond in deep appreciation of the good gesture that Jesus had extended to you. Number two, it will be callous on our part to hold Jesus to ransom. For having a desire to share his life with us in marriage. Number three, it is a delay of divine calendar. If we will not do what we ought to do now, do you get what I've said? Okay. So, I think this is a convenient point for me to stop. Because I know the Holy Ghost must bring us back here tomorrow to now sit down and look at the implication of what the bride must do. But I must tell you, sir, and she shall shave her head. I do not also think the Bible is just talking by mistake. When he say she must shave her head I know it will have been more reasonable to say, shave her hair. We use the word head. Do you know? The headship of your life. has to be shaved. You must lose your head so that he can provide the head. The first thing that God is expecting you to do is to shave your head never to live for yourself again. He has done so much. 
he deserves to be the head. To be the head. To be the controlling center of our lives. To take our bearing no more from where we are coming from. No more from what we know how to do before. To con to cons uh, what do you do now? What do you do now? To cons concede. Is that the right word? To concede to him the pedagogical authority over our lives. To hand over to him our head. I said, God, since you have this desire towards me, a captain, I surrender all. I'll no longer run my life the way I like. Do you know that the only thing that gives you identity is your head? I don't know whether you know that. If they cut a man's head off now, can you identify him? No. And in fact, they don't even need to cut the head. They just mask this place. Can you identify him? No, you can't. Every other identity, an identification mark that you have been struggling to have in your life, what did he say you should do to it? Shave it. Shave it off. And give him that place. People want to be beneficiaries of his grace. Beneficiaries of his word. Beneficiaries of his power. Beneficiary of his name, of his authority. In the name of Jesus. 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 And you want the devil to bow. But you are still maintaining your head. You know the Bible says, the head of every woman is the man. Since I'm not preaching on marriage tonight, let me not double there. But the truth is that if your marriage is going to work, no matter how educated you are, the truth is that bring, put your head, put off your head, And let your husband be the head. That's when you will have a proper identity. But that's not this. We are talking of another mystery. Christ, God had made him the head of unto all things, unto the church. Is that not what the Bible says? Shave your head. That's the first thing. Shave that your head. That your calculation. That your human wisdom. That your own idea. That your own self will. Shave it. Concede to Jesus the lordship, the authority, the headship of your life. I don't know any decision that the body takes, human body, that does not involve the head. When any organ of the body begins to function on its own, without the coordination of the body, of the head, do you know what has happened? Insanity. It's insanity. I'm asking you a question. Shave your head. That there have been nothing that you venture to do in your life again apart from the headship of the Lord Jesus. And she shall. But I told you that they didn't use must. It was deliberate. If Jesus said, 
must is like whether you like it or not. So what will have happened? You will have jumped and said, okay, okay, whether you like me or not, I will sit on your neck. But he won't do that. He will have become a tyrant. If he forces people's head, brother, come down. Let me trouble you. Don't worry. I trouble elders. But because I don't have young people here, that's why I'm troubling you. See me and him. You know we're almost the same height. Is that all right? But if, if he wants me to look more taller, what will he do? He will bend down. He will just bend down. And refuse to be seen. He's making me hear. The other way is for me to do like this. <laughs> when you see me doing like this to a man, what will you call me immediately? <laughs> say, this man is a tyrant. That's how some of you want Jesus to do. You don't want to willingly yield to his authority. You are waiting until he forced you. The relationship he wanted to bring you into is a relationship of love. He is not ready to demonstrate power. If it was to demonstrate power, uh -uh. that's why some of you are surprised. And say, ah, if what I'm doing is not correct, Jesus should have done something and stopped me. Why? No. It's the devil that does that kind of thing. I hear some people say, well, if that business you want, I'm doing, if you don't like it, if you want to prove to me that it's not correct for you, then let everything scatter. God doesn't do that. God doesn't do that. He can do it, but he, do, he doesn't do it because he will be a tyrant. He's looking for a willing submission. Somebody that said, I noticed that you don't like it. You don't need to chase me around. I surrender. You don't need to chase me up and down. I yield my neck voluntarily unto you. That's the kind of man that we're talking about. Not people that are waiting until a calamity happens. We're not talking of people like Balaam. Balaam went to pray. God said, don't go with them. He still saddled his house. He went. When he got on the road, the angel was annoyed with him, unwanted to kill him. And the ass opened the mouth and said, Oh God, now today I they carry you. Abba. Ah, why are you beating me? And then the man said, These three times you have disgraced me. He said, Am I not running away from the angel that would have killed you? And then the angel appeared. Instead of Balaam to go back, do you know what Balaam said? And so, if uh, you don't want me to go, I will go back. If you are saying I should go back, I will go back. When I read my Bible, I check such things and I say, I wanted to see the response of God. You know what God said? God said, Go. Go. Since that time that Balaam started going like that, he died a soothsayer. I don't want God to compel me to obey him. I want to obey him as a response of love. If God is calling you into full-time ministry, don't let it be retrenchment. 
when you are retrenched, you say, God, I thank God the way I was. In fact, that now I'm in the full time ministry. That's not glorious. That's not glorious. You must come to a point in your life when it is you. He said, and she shall shave. Nobody will shave it for her. Nobody should shave it for you. You see, you know the message I told you? I said, this message itself is for the captives that have been delivered, that understands the desire of God for their lives. After all the years of your experience, you have experienced the power of God, you are speaking in tongues and all of that, that's when this message is coming to you. It's coming to pastors, it's coming to elders. And what does he say? Shave your head. We cannot have the kind of bride that Jesus is looking for. When we have people who are taking decisions by themselves. The first major problem in the church today is that we have a group of vagabonds, disobedient Christians, people who are doing their own things by themselves, men who are being led of the flesh and not of the spirit. That's the first problem. People who say, I want to walk in Lagos. Father, approve it. <laughs> Many times I go for meetings and I will see a girl who come and said, agree with me, brother, that I should get that job. In the name of Jesus. For he says, concerning my work, concerning my work, Command ye me. That's the kind of Christians we are listening now. Arrogant Christians. Christians that are eager to use Jesus. They like to use his name, they like to use his word, they like to use his power to their own advantage. And if anybody is preaching the gospel and is not preaching a utilitarian gospel, you are not interested. As you are hearing the one say, what will he do for me? That's not the correct gospel. It's not right. It's not right. I feel like crying. It's not correct. What kind of children are we unto God? That is always a baggage. Always a bargain. If you are going to give God uh, 10,000 naira, just 10,000 naira, you are saying, God, I'm giving you 10,000 naira. But commit yourself based on this Bible verse. I'm sowing this as a seed faith. I hope to reap. You remember my house project? <laughs> Commit yourself. I feel like crying. Yeah, that's the popular message. What kind of Christians are we producing? Whereas when you read the Bible, you see men that said, Thy will, O Lord, be done at my expense. The Bible says he became obedient unto death even when that death is a criminal death. He agreed. I'm asking you, brother. Are you just obeying because there's there's a a goody-goody somewhere? There's a promise. The scripture you always quote 
that is anybody who left father and mother and this and that, he will give him 100 fold in this world. Let me tell you. Do you know that that message was not said to the, the, the disciples when Jesus called them? When Jesus called Peter, what did he tell him? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What else did he promise him? Why is it that anytime we want to talk to people, we start from the promised side? That is apologetic gospel. It's like Jesus is begging to be heard, begging to be followed, begging to be obeyed. What kind of leader is that? They stand and say, I'm begging you. Please, please, please obey me so that so that I will not be disgraced. What kind of leader is that? And that's what I'm saying. The church gradually becoming the utilitarian gospel. Gospel of utilities. But those ones obeyed God even when there's nothing. Abraham left everything. And until the time he died, do you know that he did not yet get anything in the land of Canaan? Do you know that? By the time Sarah, the wife of Abraham, died, that's after about 67 years that they have been living in the land of Canaan. He has not one single plot of land. You may not know how terrible it was that day. His wife died. Where to bury is the problem. <clears throat> when they carry hole to go and dig here, somebody comes and says, excuse me, now your father's land did that that you are trying to make my father's inheritance a burial ground. Please, oh, sorry. We didn't intend to use this place as public burial ground. They came back to Excuse me, sir. That place that we thought we could dig the grave, they said, no, it doesn't belong to you. Go that side. He went there. As soon as he said, get around the first digger. So I said, excuse me, sir. Are you not trespassing? Is this your father's land? They went and reported. Do you know that they couldn't bury Sarah until there was a community meeting? Do you remember? Go back and read your Bible now. And the people gathered. And Abraham said, Give me a portion of land I will buy that I may bury Sarah out of my face. You didn't read the Bible. Out of my face. You know the meaning of that? This thing had been on my face for long. I've been, I wake up, I see it. I wake up, I, see, I sleep. I don't know. Let me bury out of sight now. The sons of hate say, well, eh, well, we are not saying you should not bury your, your wife. Bury your wife. Bury your wife. Everybody has his own father's land. You know, if anybody die here now and he's from Anambra State, what will you do? You will take them back. The Bible said, Abraham had opportunity to have returned back to his own country. That's another opportunity. It will only take three days to go back. But he said, no. 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 I have obeyed God. I can't go back there. Do you know that day, the only possession that that man had in the land of promise was the cave of Machepela that he bought before he could bury his wife. What kind of faith 
is that. If we put that kind of faith side by side with the present current faith that you are preaching and that you are believing, is that faith? And yet the Bible said they have obtained good report. When men stood up in our age and they bastardized faith and made faith an acquisitory faith, they have done damage to the word of God. The Bible said this, all died in faith not yet having obtained the promises. Did they backslide? If you started coming to church and the promise they told you didn't come to pass, will you still, will you still continue? Will you not say this thing I tried very many times, I've gone there, I've prayed here, there's this deliverance, I don't see anything there. You will start missing fellowship. And it's like the only thing people are gathering around now is little, little things they can catch from Jesus. This is not right. Let her do what? Shame ahead. Willingly. And I'm asking you to do it tonight as we pray together. I'm asking you, will you willingly yield your life to Jesus? Will you willingly say, Lord, take my head the leadership of my life from this moment. It will no longer be I leading my life. And I don't want you to coerce me. I will willingly do it. Joyfully, gladly, responsibly, I yield my life. That thing that is not starting with the bearing of your leadership in my life, I give it up. Stand up. Let's go to heaven as we pray. Lift up your heart. Lift up your voice. Let's talk to God. Let's talk to the Lord together. If you have experienced deliverance, if he has captured you from the kingdom of darkness and has brought you home into the kingdom of his dear son, and he has expressed a desire, I will have you share with me. I will have you be part of the bride. The first thing, she shall shave her head. What's your, what's, what's your decision? Nobody should shave it for you. Nobody should press and cut off your head by, for you. That would be tyranny. Can you willingly, willingly and personally, can you yield to the Savior? Can you yield and say, Lord, King of my life, I surrender. I willingly surrender my life. Take control. Take absolute control. Take my decision for me from today. Jesus be the Lord of all. The kingdoms of my heart. 